In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we're still on the subject of child abuse, and it is the Lord's desire above all else that the abused child recover and be restored to spiritual health. This is God's will. And the uh, sins of the arrogance complex, therefore, combine with the sins of the emotional complex, that is, for the abused child, and it trashes the soul and it adds garbage to your subconscious into the stream of consciousness, and that occurs from childhood abuse. This garbage is never taken out to sea and buried, as it says, with the millstone, and we'll study this in detail. And the only way to uh, get rid of that uh, garbage in the soul, the only way to stop Montaiotes, the vacuum in the soul, is through daily perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. It's difficult for someone who has been abused to do so, but uh, God in His grace does provide the way. And therefore, when you learn doctrine, the garbage in your stream of consciousness, as it were, is taken out to the sea and buried. So, uh, therefore, if you've uh, been exposed to child abuse, it is not necessary for you to react to it. That's one of the most terrible things that occurs, is reaction to child abuse. And that's, a part, and that's on the part of the one who has been abused. Now, it's a, there's a natural reaction in childhood in which you use the defense mechanisms. But in adulthood, you should start to make your own decisions to throw that in the past, throw it in the sea, as it were, and to find the solutions to the problem, and the solutions only lie in the flight line. Now, eventually, I'm going to get either a handout for all of us or a printout in which I'll show it up here on the board of maybe tomorrow or the next day. And it's going to be concerning the problem-solving devices versus the defense mechanisms. Now, I'll go ahead and give you an outline of what this is going to look like, but you'll be getting a handout tomorrow. Now, the problem-solving devices, of course, start out with rebound. And that would be the first solution to child abuse. Because of guilt reaction, you're going to have to rebound guilt. Because of a uh, guilty conscience and because of other things such as anger and bitterness and all of those emotional sins and the arrogance complex of sins, you must rebound those sins. Now, on the other hand, now that's the problem-solving device. Now, as a child, when you have the uh, the uh, device, the devices such as repression, the defense mechanisms. On the other hand, the defense mechanisms, instead of rebound, you justify yourself. You either blame your childhood experiences experiences on your sins or you uh, deceive yourself or move into self-absorption, and therefore that is the opposite side of it. Now, if you decide to justify your sins and say, I'm angry, I have a right to be angry, I have been mistreated in life, and it's probably true that you have, especially under the concept of child abuse, but you still must use rebound, and rebound is the solution. And then with the defense mechanisms, there's a problem because under the concept of the defense mechanisms, that's on the other side, you use self-justification. Then, of course, the second problem-solving device is the filling of God the Holy Spirit. That is a problem-solving device. And the problem is when you use the defense mechanisms, uh, you don't, you, you're not filled with God the Holy Spirit. Instead, you're filled with bitterness and as such as that. And even if you rebound, the bitter thoughts come back into your mind immediately. So what we have under the concept of the filling of God the Holy Spirit, that's the only way to grow spiritually. But under the defense mechanisms on the other side of the coin, we have self-deception. And that is, uh, you deceive yourself into believing you're right. You deceive yourself into believing you're always right. 
And there's never a time when you could even consider yourself to be wrong. And when you're in that state, you're not filled with God the Holy Spirit, but rather living in carnality. But as a defense mechanism, that is the solution that was given to you in childhood. But when you carry it over into adulthood, it completely counters the problem-solving devices. It's actually a counterfeit. And uh, for the adult believer, it's a, a satanic counterfeit. Instead of being filled with God and the Holy Spirit, you are in Cosmos Diabolicus and you're there because you have not rebounded because of self-justification. And then even if you do rebound because of self-deception, uh, you don't even think you're wrong. You don't even realize you're sinning through using certain things such as repression. And you can write repression there as well. Instead of being filled with God the Holy Spirit, you have repressed. And repression means you uh, forget, you hide it. You don't even know. Uh, you don't even uh, know that you've sinned. It's a, a form of repression that definitely occurs under the concept of child abuse because the child can't handle it, so the child represses it and forgets about it. But in the spiritual life, you can't uh, forget about it before rebound. You have to know that you've been wrong. Then you have to rebound. Then you have to maintain the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, by avoiding those defense mechanisms. Then the third uh, of the problem-solving devices is the faith rest drill. And under the concept of the faith rest drill, you claim the promises of God. And you use those as a solution. Um, and I will refine this. Uh, it's not going to be exact. I'll refine it and think about it and come with it and, and get an exact system of how these parallel with each other uh, eventually. Uh, but right now, it's, it's a thought in my mind about how these things counter each other. So you have the faith rest drill, a problem-solving device. Yet, under the defense mechanisms, you use uh, things such as dissociation. Instead of claiming a promise, you simply dissociate yourself from the situation. And uh, dissociation is part of repression, and we'll study all of these things in detail. Uh, but you could say, uh, instead of using the faith rest drill, you use uh, dissociation, in which you simply dissociate yourself from the problem, and uh, therefore that's part of your human solution. It's not a divine solution. All of this has been given to us at birth in order that we can handle things as children, but when we become adults, we become responsible, whether abused or not, to learn the unique spiritual life. Then we have, of course, grace orientation. And grace orientation is very important in your growth because you must grow in grace first and in knowledge. And therefore, grace orientation and doctrinal orientation work in tandem. And under the concept of grace orientation, you get to a point where you recognize everyone is depraved, everyone needs a Savior, everyone lives the spiritual life by grace. Therefore, all of the self-righteous attitudes uh, go out the window. When you reach grace orientation, you have just replaced uh, self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is used by the person who is under the concept of the defense mechanisms. Instead of grace orientation, they use self-righteousness. And under grace orientation, it would be easy for the abused person to uh, mentally picture the ab abuser as being out to sea because you understand God's going to take care of them and therefore you bury your past with that abuser. And that's how you should function under grace orientation. But with the, de the defense mechanisms, you get very self-righteous. How dare that person wrong me in such a way? And they did. And uh, But you uh, take it very personal, and it is personal. But you uh, get to a point in which you just disregard the problem-solving devices, or you don't even know about them. So instead of grace orientation, self-righteousness. Then we have doctrinal orientation. And instead of doctrinal orientation, on the other hand, with the defense mechanisms, you don't have the doctrine, and therefore you don't have doctrinal orientation, but you have a human viewpoint on life. So on the other side would be the defense mechanism, human viewpoint. And that's where you go to psychologists. Now, psychiatry is good because they prescri prescribe the medicine that one needs. 
But uh, psychology is a different story altogether. Psychology mainly deals with the human viewpoint. There are a few uh, doctrinal principles that they obviously uh, grab onto here and there, but it's mostly 100% human viewpoint. So instead of doctrinal orientation, you have human viewpoint orientation. And people tell you you are the way you are because of what happened to you as a child. And while there is some truth to that, but it's really, um, it really is all set by volition. Because all of us have volition whether we've been abused or not. And there have been abused people who have used their volition to go to spiritual maturity. And there have been abused people who use their volition to reject the spiritual life. And so there, it, it's not an excuse, is what I'm saying. And instead of doctrinal orientation, you go the human viewpoint route as part of your solution. Then we move, of course, to a personal sense of destiny. And under the concept of a personal sense of destiny, we develop what is called spiritual self-esteem. And in spiritual self-esteem, uh, we, we understand full well that we're a royal family of God. And there are many applications to spiritual self-esteem. And when you go into an interview for a job, instead of being uh, nervous about it, instead of feeling inferior about it, you should walk into the interview knowing that you have a personal sense of destiny, knowing that you're a royal family of God, and that uh, nothing should shake you. And nothing should uh, cause you to have any type of anxiety or worry. And therefore, you use your spiritual self-esteem. But on the other hand, you use human self-esteem. And you uh, build yourself up uh, through arrogance. It's all a part of human self-esteem. Usually derived from approbation lust, which is approval lust. And a lot of people who have been abused constantly seek approval from others. And therefore, they focus their attention on people rather than on God. And this happens even with uh, people who haven't been abused, so there's application for all of us. But for those who have been abused, it becomes even more difficult. And they have a tendency toward approbation lust. And that's why many of them go toward lasciviousness. And they like the attention of men if they're a woman. And if they're a man, they like the attention of a lot of women. Approbation lust or approval lust. And that's part of building up human self-esteem, and that is part of the defense mechanism as well. Then, of course, we move on from a, a personal sense of destiny in which we have spiritual self-esteem. We move on to personal love for God the Father, and that is a problem-solving device for us. Personal love for God the Father. For the abused person who doesn't take interest in the Word of God, they don't have a personal love for God the Father. So uh, their means of solution is a uh, personal love uh, toward people. And what they have is uh, what develops with them instead of personal love for God the Father is they idolize certain people. Instead of making a role mo model out of God, they mo make a role model out of others. And they fall under a trap called iconoclastic arrogance. Because they'll meet someone, and this, what, what, this is what makes the abused person so unstable. They'll meet someone, and they'll uh, really take a liking to them right off because they seem nice and sweet and very kind to them. And then once they hang around this person long enough and they build them up on a pedestal, they see the feet of clay. And they say to themselves, I would never think this person would betray me in that way. Therefore, the abused person takes the person who has betrayed them and lowers them to the level of their first abuse incident in which that person in their minds is just as bad as the abuser. Therefore, they, uh, th their personal love for God the Father, instead they have a lot of personal love for individuals and those individuals disappoint them. Therefore, they fall all apart and they move into iconoclastic arrogance and they destroy that person, even though they put that person on the pedestal. The person may have never wanted to be on a pedestal, yet uh, they knew him in a friendship, put him on a pedestal. Then when they messed up or betrayed them in some way, well, then you will smash them under your feet. That's part of the defense mechanisms. And you can see that there's really no solutions in this, just an intensification of misery. And then we have, of course, after that, impersonal love for all mankind. And that's what we have as part of having uh, living in our spiritual lives. 
we learn to develop over time impersonal love for all mankind. And we know that impersonal love uh, means that uh, the, the object of our love, it doesn't depend on the object. The object could be obnoxious. The object could be very critical of us. The object could be, uh, the object could be the abuser. But you are commanded to have impersonal love anyway. Therefore, now that doesn't mean personal love. It means you love them not based on who and what they are. You love them based on your integrity. In the same way that God loved us based on His integrity, even when we were fallen, even when we were unbelievers. He still loved us with a perfect love, but it didn't depend on us. It depended on His love. That is the concept of impersonal love. But for the abused person, they don't have that. If they haven't gotten with the doctrine, they don't have it. So they actually have impersonal hate for mankind. And the abused person develops impersonal hate for mankind. In which they, uh, that's where we get the people that we've ran it, run into before. And they always say, the whole world's against me. The whole world hates me. Everyone is always on my back trying to uh, intimidate me, destroy me, etc. Or hurt my feelings. And they take everything personal. And therefore, it's impersonal hate. And they, uh, what I mean by this is uh, they hate people based on who and what they are. They're full of hatred. They're full of rage because of the abuse. And also because of their volition. The abuse uh, leads them in that direction. But they can break th through that and break from that if they would uh, grow in grace and in knowledge. And, of course, sometimes it takes a little uh, help from medicine. But if they would latch on to the spiritual life, they would learn these things. But it's daily. And for the abused person, oftentimes it takes a, an even more than a one-hour-a-day grind for the abused person. They have a lot to break through. And a, a lot of abused people have uh, listened to my pastor and they woke up and they realized, hey, this is the only hope for me. And they've latched on to it and, and just simply shot right past all their peers in spiritual growth because uh, they uh, had a background in which it motivated them. So you can be actually motivated by bad circumstances and bad environments. Instead of dissuaded. As some people are dissuaded. Some people are motivated. It depends on volition. So they have impersonal hate. In which they think the whole world's against them. And uh, that's part of their modus operandi. As a problem solving device. And you might not understand what I'm saying, but uh, you've heard some people say, well, I will never uh, have a relationship with somebody because I'm protecting myself uh, just in case they hurt me. And they're already anticipating getting hurt. Well, in every relationship, you're going to get hurt. In every relationship, you're going to be betrayed. In every relationship, it's going to happen. We all have sin natures. And, and sometimes you'll be betrayed and you, you'll think you're being betrayed, but the person didn't even mean anything by it. And so you throw up walls all around you. That's part of impersonal hate. You're not going to mess with people because people will hurt you. Well, you're already assuming that they're uh, wretched creatures just like your abuser. And while they do have sin natures, they're not just like the abuser in a lot of cases. Therefore, you don't have impersonal love, but impersonal hate. You start out in life automatically uh, just uh, assuming people are uh, terrible, and they are in terms of depravity, but you uh, assume that you can't have relationships because they'll hurt you. It's part of being self-absorbed because all of us at some point are going to be hurt by people, and all we need is the problem-solving devices. But under the concept of the defense mechanisms, this is how they function. Therefore, a lot of abused people become uh, recluses. And they do not go out in society for fear of being hurt, out of paranoia even. They even get to a point where they're paranoid concerning people. And uh, they'll be walking through a store or Walmart or something and somebody will look at them and immediately they'll have a paranoid thought that that person's thinking harshly about them when that person doesn't even know them or that that person's going to make fun of them, etc. And it's a part of being completely self-absorbed and that's also part of having impersonal hate instead of impersonal love. And then, of course, we move on from impersonal love to plus H, sharing the happiness of God. And that is, we're moving toward the ultimate in our spiritual life. And when we get to that point, that means that no one can disturb your happiness. It means that no circumstance 
can disturb your happiness. Plus H, sharing the happiness of God. No circumstance, no one person can destroy your happiness. If your wife or your husband gets upset with you, if you have plus H, uh, you simply, uh, it doesn't bother you. You understand that they have a sin nature. You're using grace orientation. You're also using impersonal love. And therefore, you have plus H and you're happy. And while they're miserable criticizing you or whatever they do, uh, you can still sit through it and be completely happy and relaxed and say whatever and keep watching your football game or, or whatever you're doing and just no, don't even worry about it. Don't even think about it. That's plus H. But on the other hand, for the uh, abused person, if they function under the defense mechanisms their whole life and they never get with the Word of God, they will move into a, a section in which they share the misery of the abuser. So on the one hand, sharing the happiness of God. On the other hand, sharing the misery of the abuser. The person who has abused, if they haven't gotten with the spiritual life, is miserable, terribly miserable. And God makes sure that they're miserable through divine punishment. And some of the most miserable human beings on the face of the earth are those who have abused children. And they're under constant divine discipline. And even if they're an unbeliever, uh, they receive a lot of opportunities in which they can uh, believe in Christ. And, and uh, I won't get personal, but uh, there's, there's people who have been unbelievers and they just simply, uh, they'll hear the gospel and reject it because they have scar tissue on the soul from child abuse and therefore they reject the gospel and they're miserable. And God get, makes their lives totally miserable on earth and then when they die they go to hell and they receive even more misery. But for the person who has been abused, they have a choice. They can either get with the problem-solving devices or they can stay with the defense mechanisms. And if they stay with the defense mechanisms, they end up sharing in the misery of the abuser. Sharing the misery of the abuser. And uh, in fact, they're just as bad off because they haven't taken the spiritual solution. And therefore, they're full of guilt. They're full of bitterness. They're full of rage just as the abuser is. So they're in the same boat. And that's what occurs under the defense mechanisms. And, and that builds up scar tissue for the one who has been abused. If they share the misery of the abuser, and that's what happens. And a lot of them share even the lifestyle and behavior of the abuser. That's the way they were taught. That's the way they were raised. And then when they have a family of their own, they do the same thing. And it's a part of sharing the misery of the abuser. And then, of course, uh, the ultimate is occupation with Christ. That is the ultimate for us, to be occupied with Christ. <coughs> However, for the person under the defense mechanisms, they are occupied with circumstances. They are occupied with environment. And this is what they teach them if they go into psychology sessions. They'll say, well, you grew up in a terrible environment. That's why you are the way you are. And therefore, what you need to do is improve your environment. You need to uh, think, you need to first of all have human self-esteem. This is what they say. First of all, you need to have human self-esteem in which you can rise up and change your environment and make it better. And when your environment is better and when you're around a lot of supportive people who give you a lot of support, then you'll be happy. It's a focus on environment, not on Christ. Occupation with Christ is the ultimate, not occupation with people, definitely not occupation with environment. And this is, a, this is definitely a biblical principle because uh, Satan is always trying to create perfect environment in order to, because he thinks that creates happiness. Satan equates happiness with perfect environment. So when you're under his system, you equate good environment with happiness. And that's just it's not the case. You could be going through a, a terrible time. It could be, the environment could be harsh. It could be 100 degrees and you're sweating, you don't have any money and you're working hard, and yet you can have a far greater happiness in that environment than a, a rich person who is sitting 
in air conditioning, uh, sipping on his uh, nightly uh, favorite beverage of liquor and such, and feeling good. Uh, but uh, the person who has doctrine can be happy in all circumstances. And so, instead of occupation with Christ, the defense mechanisms, have, they are occupied with environment. When environment is good, they associate it with happiness. When environment is bad, they associate it with misery. Yet, they're miserable all the time. And this goes not only for the abused person, but also for the uh, average Joe living in the cosmic system. And so, but uh, the abused person really latches on to either one because uh, their volition is strong either way. They're either going to go all out in the cosmic system or go all out for doctrine. That's why so many abused people go all out in lasciviousness. That's why so many abused people go all out in alcoholism and go all out in drug abuse and go all out in terms of raising hell because they think that'll make them happy. And then on the other hand, the person might say, the only happiness is with doctrine. I've been through hell on earth and these this is going to change because I'm going to have post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation and therefore they sprint toward the high ground and they leave that abuser in the dust, in the sea, buried. And that's the only way to go. So, of course, the beginning principle that I started with, it is the Lord's desire above all else that the abused child or the abused person recover and be restored to spiritual health. Now, a lot of people who have been abused, especially by their parents or a marital partner, such as a stepfather, uh, they usually think the solution to their problem is to run down the parents or that marital partner, to rip them apart, to tell the world what terrible creeps they are. And they may be, but that's not going to build happiness. You can't build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness. It's impossible. Now, I've known people who uh, have uh, become very gleeful when they think that uh, somebody in, in their periphery whom they hate is going through a hard time and they get happy. So-and-so broke their leg in a car accident and they're miserable. And then the person who hates them uh, laughs at how it's about time they got theirs. And that you're trying to build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness. And today, by the way, there's a whole political party trying to build their happiness on the unhappiness of one president, George Bush. They think that if they can make George Bush feel miserable, they'll be happy. They think that if they wake up in the morning and they see a poll that says George Bush only has 30% approval, they'll walk around with a smile on their face all day, and that's disgusting. They're trying to build their happiness on someone else's unhappiness. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't bother George Bush. He's, he's going to be president for, what, three more years now. He's been elected. He can't be reelected again, so what's it matter? He doesn't really care. But they are so, they're so enraged with hate that they think anything they can... Um, they, they try to put a thorn in his flesh all the time. <coughs> he is a believer, by the way. I don't know how much of the problem-solving devices he has, uh, but from uh, seeing how he handles it all, I, I tell you what, I, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> oh, man, no way. Those reporters snipping at me like that all day? Uh-uh. I, I would be impeached because I would go off on them, and that might show some spiritual weakness on my part. But he is a believer, and he's a good president, yet they want to rip him apart and build their happiness on his unhappiness. So running down your parents because they've been abusive or running down a, uh, one of, a marital partner because they've been abusive is not a solution to the problem. Child abuse, this is a principle. Child abuse in the past. Child abuse in the past is no excuse for marital failure in the present on behalf of the one who has been abused. And oftentimes marriages have fallen apart because the one who has been abused has a lot of emotional hang-ups in life. And therefore, the marriage suffers. So again, child abuse in the past is no excuse for marital failure in the present on behalf of the one who has been abused. Oftentimes, the one who has been abused has a terrible, terrible time adjusting to marriage because they've developed the defense mechanisms. And therefore, in the normal confines of marriage, there will be insults traded every now and then in the heat of battle. And the wife will say something negative about the husband or the husband something negative about the wife. And it, there'll be a trade of insults. 
For the abused person who, do, who has been using the defense mechanisms, they take any insult they receive, and it, no matter how trivial the insult is, they take any insult, anything that they disagree with, and they trash it in the same manner that they trash the child abuser in their soul. In other words, they've always been running down the child abuser because he's a creep, and he is, but you don't need to run him down. And then when the husband that you've been married to or the wife with whom you are married to, and if you've been abused and that husband or wife insults you, or uh, whether it be real or imagined, you will trash them in the same way you trash the child abuser. Therefore, you create a tremendous problem in marriage. And you make marriage nearly impossible for the other person who uh, might be stable. You make it nearly impossible, of course, if they don't have the problem-solving devices firmly in place. That marriage will fall apart. But when the abused child gets with the Word of God, then uh, they, not only will they succeed, but their marriage will succeed. And you have to understand that we are no better as people and we are no better in marriage than we are as people. We're no better in marriage than we are as people. If we personally fail in marriage because we are insulted very easily, because we take umbrage to everything that our partner does and says, then it's your fault and you'll be no better as a single person. Uh, you'll be just as miserable, if not more miserable. And, uh, and that is in, in most cases. Now, of course, we've studied divorce, and there are legitimate cases where divorce is allowed, such as adultery and uh, abuse, that is, physical abuse, where they, uh, if, they, if the husband beats his wife half to death, leave. Legitimate reason for divorce, but not a legitimate reason for remarriage. We've studied that. I won't go back over it. But in marriage, if you take what any little insult or perceived insult and uh, and really uh, make problems for the other partner because of it, you're making marriage nearly impossible, and therefore you must get with the Word of God. And then when you get with the Word of God, you become better as a person. And when you become better as a person, you become better in marriage. And we must understand that as believers, uh, marriage and the spiritual life are mutually inclusive. Marriage and the spiritual life are mutually inclusive. Because as goes your spiritual life, so goes your marriage. Now there are cases in which one partner goes the full route of the spiritual life and they sustain the marriage. They keep it together. They're the staying power. They're the glue. And uh, the, the most optimum case for a great marriage is when both are growing in grace and in knowledge. But if both of you are failing in the spiritual life, as goes your spiritual lives together, so goes your marriage. And that's why Christians can't stay married today. They don't have a spiritual life. And uh, it's funny to me how come nobody's ever wondered, uh, especially pastors who have, uh, been, who have, mar who have uh, performed marriages in their churches, and they've performed several of them, and those same marriages fall all apart, and they have counseling and all that. And it, it's a wonder the pastor doesn't wake up and say, "What's going on here? What, what, what's going on is they're not you're not feeding them. That's what's going on. They don't have a spiritual life, and without the spiritual life, your marriage will fail. And that's why unbelievers have have been known to have greater marriages than believers." And George Burns always comes to my mind, an unbeliever, a Jew, unbeliever. He loved his wife, he loved his job, and he had a wonderful marriage. Far greater, a far better and greater marriage than uh, most believers have ever had. Well, he had divine establishment, and that's about it, and he's in hell today, unfortunately. But for us as believers, we have a spiritual life to live, and if we forsake our spiritual lives, you might as well just forsake your marriage and everything else, because you will. If you forsake your, uh, if you forsake your spiritual life, you just as well uh, have gotten a divorce. Really, uh, you have just ruined everything. You've ruined your life. Whether you've ruined your life if you're single, you ru you've ruined your married life if you're married. You've ruined your family life if you have a family. 
And that's why children are having such a hard time. Christian children are having such a hard time because families are not getting with the Word of God. There was a time in this country, while they didn't uh, have all the pieces of doctrine put together, they most definitely took an interest in it. And uh, every night they, they would uh, uh, sit by their fireplace because they didn't have television. And uh, the father would open up the Bible and begin reading and instructing. And of course... Uh, there was a, a much greater interest in the Word of God. Not that you can learn the Word of God by reading it on your own, but they didn't have the technology we have today where we can uh, slap in a tape. And they did the best they could, and they always made sure that their children knew that the most important thing was the Word of God. That was back when the country was great. Now we're going into degeneracy, and uh, so people really aren't that enthused about doctrine. There's uh, there's uh, too many distractions out there, and uh, God will slowly take away those distractions over time, take away prosperity, in order to wake people up to the importance of it. So believers reacting to their childhood, uh, if you're a believer and you react to your childhood, especially childhood abuse, you are presently absorbed with yourself. And you're so absorbed with yourself that you, you have actually excluded reality uh, from your life. You're not living in reality. Believers reacting to their childhood and presently absorbed with themselves, um, re this results in exclusion of present reality. So God's grace and present provision is for their life at that time. And instead of looking at God's grace and knowing that God has provision for them, instead of looking at God's grace and saying, yes, I've been abused, yes, it's been terrible, yes, I've lived a, a horrible life in my childhood, but God, I'm still living and God has a matchless grace for me and a gracious plan for me. Instead of doing that, they're so absorbed with themselves, they're too busy whining about what occurred in their childhood. Therefore, they daily create more garbage in their soul. And it, it gets sucked into the stream of consciousness. Because if they don't get on doctrine, just as if anyone doesn't get on doctrine as a believer, it opens up matayotes, which is a vacuum in the soul. And instead of sucking in doctrine, it sucks in all the satanic lies that are out there, sucks in all the human viewpoint, and it, uh, it, it makes great use out of the defense mechanisms. And that's all they use, defense mechanisms. And if you don't understand all of them, you don't now. I understand that. I haven't went over them. But one thing to know about defense mechanisms, uh, all the defense mechanisms uh, do is this. It makes the person say to themselves, I'm always right. Everyone else is wrong. That's why the person can say, I'm always wrong, even though they're not. But they say it because they believe they're always right. How can the whole world be against you? The whole world don't even care about you. But they're so filled with themselves and so arrogant, they think that the whole world's sitting around thinking about how to destroy them. It's all a result of defense mechanisms, and defense mechanisms say, I'm always right. That's one of the main principles of defense mechanisms, and all of the different systems that come out of it, really in the end, it's just a way for the person to say, I'm always right. And that's a way for the person to never rebound, to never be filled with God the Holy Spirit, to never use the faith rest drill. Why would they need those things when they're always right? And that's exactly what occurs, not only with the child abused uh, persons, but with uh, those people who have rejected the Word of God as well. Because this results in buildup of scar tissue, and anyone who has built up scar tissue in the soul rejects the Word of God, and they get to a point where they say, I'm right, everyone else is wrong. That's what legalism does, by the way. They're right. doesn't matter how much doctrine you throw in the face of a legalist. doesn't matter how long they listen to it. If they reject it, they're right. You're wrong. And there's no common sense you can speak it. You can't, you can't give them common sense. You can't even give them the hundreds of scriptures dealing with faith alone and Christ alone. You've known people like that, probably in the tongues movement or something else. And you probably went up to them and gave them the gospel over and over, told them you can't lose your salvation, and they look at you like you're crazy, and then you give them all the, the doctrine related to it and all the scriptures, and they don't even listen to it. They're right, and you're wrong. They're right, and scripture's wrong as far as they're concerned. Because you could show them scripture, and that's not the way I read it. They'll say something like that. How can you, how can you read it any differently? You are deceiving yourself. 
And those people you might as well walk away from. There's no hope. They've made their decision to be right all the time. And there's no way you can convince them otherwise. And no way whatsoever. They are stuck in the defense mechanisms. Cruelty is one of the things that an abused child uses as a defense mechanism. This is another point. Cruelty is one of the things that an abused child uses as a defense mechanism. And when you see children uh, who have a predilection to beat animals, to kill animals, to kill their own dog or their own cat, you have just uh, you are witnessing a child who has probably been abused. That's one of the strong indications because uh, they have uh, endured cruelty. So they, in defense mechanism, use cruelty on their own. And they lash out on a pet. So if they find, therefore, uh, once the child abuser gets older, if they find one thing wrong with someone else, they consider that person to be all wrong. Just one thing. There's something wrong with all of us. We can all find a flaw in each one of us if we were busy uh, with our uh, long proboscis trying to figure it out and say, what's wrong with this person? Well, there's something wrong with all of us. We have, all have a sin nature and we all have weaknesses. Uh, but for the abused person who has grown up and not gotten with the spiritual life, they find one thing wrong with someone else. Therefore, they consider the whole person to be all wrong. They see one person do something and they won't listen to them ever again. And this happens a lot in churches. Uh, somebody gets wind of the pastor has done something stupid or the pastor has committed a sin or has done something that might not be a sin but has done something they don't like. And immediately, no matter what that pastor says, no matter how much doctrine that pastor is giving out, if there's one thing that is perceived at, that he has done wrong, that's it. No more listening to that fellow. Because he's all wrong. One thing wrong, he must be all wrong. And all pastors face uh, that dilemma with uh, people who are arrogant, but you have to keep going. And my pastor faced that dilemma all the time, and sometimes he was wrong. Sometimes when he uh, got all fired up and his temper got out of hand, and uh, well, he, he was wrong, he admitted it later on. Uh, but uh, the people who were insulted said, oh no, He's wrong He's wrong because he's uh, been angry. He's not supposed to be. Therefore, he's all wrong. And that's not correct. He had a weakness like everybody has weaknesses. And you can't expect a communicator to be perfect uh, when no one is perfect. It's impossible. So believers who react to their childhood uh, become so self-absorbed with themselves that they reject reality. Therefore, this is called what happens when the person sees one thing wrong with someone else. I'm going to give you what it's called in psychology. Uh, and they actually do have it listed in psychology. A person who finds one thing wrong with someone else, therefore that whole person must be wrong, must be all wrong, must be uh, terrible. Uh, for example, uh, it would be as if uh, one person did something wrong and you equate them with Hitler. And uh, they might not be anywhere close to Hitler. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, you don't like uh, alcohol, so you see someone whom you admire uh, drink one beer and you equate them with Hitler. Well, they did one thing that you consider wrong, so their whole being is all wrong. This is called splitting. That's what it's called in psychology, splitting, S-P-L-I-T-T-I-N-G. Psychology calls this splitting. One flaw, uh, one flaw or one mistake in another person that is recognized by the abused person creates the false impression in the abused person that the entire person is all wrong, just as the abuser was all wrong. So one thing you do wrong in the eyes of someone who is using defense mechanisms, everything they do is all wrong. Therefore, they have a horrible time adjusting to life. They're maladjusted to life. And when they get married, uh, oftentimes their sex life is destroyed because they, the husband insulted them one time, so the husband is just like the abuser. Therefore, uh, how are you going to have sex with someone who is the abuser? So uh, they go on through life without uh, uh, maladaptive and not having a normal life whatsoever. Just completely maladaptive. And for the person who has married an abused person, if you made the choice, you made the choice. 
Therefore, you must have grace orientation and you must grow in grace and in knowledge and lead by example. If you're the husband, lead by the example. If you're the wife, keep your mouth shut and by doing that, you lead by example. There are cases where women lead by example. And the only way they can do it, though, as we've noted from 1 Peter chapter 3, is by not saying a word. And their leadership is shown uh, and a disaster could occur in the family. And this has happened before many times. And the wife, who had been listening to doctrine, handles the disaster very well, but the husband falls all apart. And since the wife never nagged him, and since the wife still showed respect for him, even though he was a jerk, well, he looks at her and says, I want to be like that. And that is a case in which the woman has actually led by example, although silently. The man is not commanded to be silent with regard to these things. Although, if you're married and the wife says, I don't want it, there's really not much you can do. You can say, well, this is important. I'm going to church, but it's up to, it's a, we all have volition. And it, it would be hard to deal with, but that's just the way it is. So therefore, the entire society... Has what happens is the abused person eventually gets to the point where they believe the entirety of society is just like the parent who abused them. And that's why they say all the time, the whole world's against me. Everybody's against me. That's actually a statement straight from the mouth of someone who has probably been abused. And if they haven't been abused, they haven't lived the spiritual life so that uh, they function in just about the same way. Uh, but you would be surpri surprised, absolutely surprised, by how many people have been abused. And some people have been abused and don't even know they've been abused because it wasn't sexual. We always relate it to sexual abuse. But there's abuse of, uh, there's all different types, as we've studied. And there are, in legalistic families, they make them feel so guilty about everything that uh, it really does uh, give them hang-ups in life and uh, infer inferiority complexes, everything else that uh, destroys uh, growing up spiritually unless you make Bible doctrine number one. That's the only hope for all of us, abused or not. So many believers who have been abused as children develop bitterness. And they also develop a very strong, self-righteous attitude. Remember, I gave you the listing of ten, which will probably change. Don't hold me to that exactly. I'm going to have to uh, write it out and, and consider it in my own brain for a while under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit to, to figure out how it lines up. But uh, self-righteousness, this will stay the same. You either have grace orientation or you're going to move toward self-righteousness. And therefore, the believer who has been abused as a child will develop bitterness and a very strong self-righteous at attitude. And when they have such a self-righteous attitude, this will lead to a lot of emotional trauma. And in fact, what happens is they oscillate from self-pity to self-righteousness. For example, uh, a girl who has been abused and is now a teenager or moving into her early 20s, uh, especially a girl who has been sexually abused, she is more than likely going to become lascivious. And when she is not lascivious, she is self-righteous and uh, has her nose stuck up in the air. And then when she uh, goes out every weekend, as she'll probably do, and fornicates and has a one-night stand, see, she switches from self-righteousness to self-pity. And she blames the way she is on her past. And there is, a, there is some a degree in which she could blame that, but we, we all have volition and we can change through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. So all through the week, uh, she's very self-righteous, always judging other people, always ripping apart the abuser as a terrible person, and he is. And then on the weekend, she goes out and is lascivious, uh, just as the abuser was lascivious, and therefore switches to self-pity. And back and forth, you can see the emotional trauma and the instability. So the solution is definitely not short-term. It's not found in a short-term uh, emotional type thing. And the problem today is uh, there have been a lot of abused young people who have been exposed to the gospel and they've believed and they have gone to churches looking for answers 
And the only answer they have is a short 15-minute emotional speech of dedicate yourself. And then they dedicate themselves and they feel very self-righteous. They're just feeding into their self-righteousness. And they dedicated themselves and they feel very self-righteous until next Friday when they go out and get drunk and fornicate again. Then they feel very sorry for themselves and very guilty. And it's back and forth. And then it's back to church to rededicate themselves. And the problem is there's not a one-shot deal. You can't get it from one emotional speech from a pastor. It, it's a daily process. And you can't hear, uh, you couldn't hear this message if you've been abused and uh, walk away thinking everything's fine. And not unless you listen every day, you couldn't. It's impossible. It's a daily thing. And we grow in grace daily. Just as we eat daily, we must get spiritual food daily. That's our manna from heaven. So it takes consistent, faithful teaching of the Word of God on the part of the pastor and I'm doing that, so I don't have any regrets in that. It takes consistent, faithful teaching on, uh, of the Word of God on the part of the pastor and consistent, faithful listening to the Word of God on the part of the abused. That's the only solution. It's the only solution for anyone. It's especially the only solution for the abused person. And oftentimes, if the abused person does not get on the Word of God, they become a suicide case. Or they drown themselves in alcohol or drown them or uh, kill themselves by an overdose, sometimes purposely. And uh, that's the only way they can handle it. They've come to the end of the rope and they've rejected doctrine on their own. So they didn't. Uh, so that's part of uh, their punishment, even though they did have such terrible lives. So the last principle before we move to the millstone tomorrow and tomorrow it'll be the doctrine of the millstone transfer and this is where this is where i got the concept of sharing the misery of the abuser and that's because you transfer their their millstone onto yourself so you cannot move ahead in your spiritual life. This is the last principle. You cannot move ahead in your spiritual life when you are constantly fighting the battle of defense mechanisms versus the problem-solving devices in your soul. And if you're constantly fighting that battle, it's, it, you're going to remain outside of fellowship. If you uh, commit bitterness, for example... You, because of, uh, you dwell on the past and you become bitter and angry about it. So you name that sin to God. God the Father, I have been angry and bitter. And then, uh, two seconds later, you're angry and bitter again. You don't remain filled with God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, even that rebound, uh, while it cleanses you and purifies you for two seconds, that's not enough to get moving in your spiritual life. There always must be follow through. You must follow through by applying doctrine instead of applying the defense mechanisms. We will study this in detail uh, coming up and you'll have handouts or either I'll get something up here on the board uh, to where uh, we're really going to understand this before we move on. So you cannot move ahead in your spiritual life when you're constantly fighting the battle of defense mechanisms versus the problem-solving devices in your soul. As long as there are defense mechanisms in the soul of any adult, I'm not talking about children. It's natural for them. As long as there are defense mechanisms in the soul of any adult, there is the, pot the potential for becoming neurotic or psychotic. As long as there are defense mechanisms in the soul of any adult, there is the potential for becoming neurotic or psychotic. So what they do is they look for help in, a psycho in, a, in psychology and they tell you the issue is the past. But I'm here to tell you the Word of God says the issue is not in the past. It's in the future. The answer is not in the past. It's in the future. It's in learning Bible doctrine. The issue, therefore, and these are some closing principles, the issue is not the cause. You say, the child abuse causes me to be this way. Well, uh, there might be some legitimate reasons for you to say that, but you must know this. The issue is not the cause. The issue is the solution. If you focus on the cause of the problem, you've done nothing except expand the problem. You must focus on the solution, and the only solution is Bible doctrine circulating in the stream of consciousness from which you will extrapolate your very own problem-solving devices. The issue is not the cause. 
In this case, child abuse. The issue is not the cause, child abuse. The issue is the solution, which is Bible doctrine circulating in your stream of consciousness. We use our volition to provide the cause, but God uses His sovereignty and grace to provide the solution. Sometimes we provide for ourselves our very own problems. Sometimes we use our volition to cause bitterness in our lives. Therefore, we have caused a problem. But God uses His sovereignty and grace to provide the solution. The solution for bitterness, rebound. Be filled with God the Holy Spirit. Use the faith rest drill. Claim a promise. Mix it with faith. Uh, leave people who have wronged you in the hands of the Supreme Court of Heaven. That's the solution. The past deals with causes. The past deals with causes, and if you go to a psychology session because of child abuse, they're always going to deal with the cause. You're the way you are because you were dropped on your head. Well, what do I do about it? They don't have a solution for that. A bunch of human viewpoint solutions, of course, but they're dealing on the past, and why? The past is the cause. Why deal with the cause? Let's deal with the solution. The future deals with solution. So what, what this is saying is uh, exactly what Matthew 18.6 is telling us. It is time to dump the causes in the depths of the sea and start to use the solution. It is time to dump the causes into the depths of the sea and start the solution. The solution is persist persistent, perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things so that we can come to see the importance of understanding the problem-solving devices and how they are antithetical to using the defense mechanisms. And may we recognize when we do use defense mechanisms so that we can rebound, be filled with the Spirit, use the faith rest drill, and move forward in our spiritual lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.